But then I see you tell someone as good as Craig Jones that he's not safe because you will buggy choke him. <laughs> and are you saying now that you're going to buggy choke him at ADCC? Is that the plan uh, now? I mean, if it's there, I'll take it. What is up, everybody? It is your friendly neighborhood BJJ podcast, Rapid Sparza, coming to you with another great installment of the Grappling Hour. I'm excited for you to see this episode because we talk with the incredible J Rod Rodriguez. That is right, Jacob Rodriguez, who set the world on fire with his run at ADCC trials. But before we get to that interview, we do have kind of a big announcement here at the show. So going forward, we're going to be doing a subscription based service. Now, what does that mean? Well, you're still going to get to see the interviews. Obviously, I don't want to take that away from you guys. However, we are going to give exclusive first looks to those who subscribe to our content. So going forward, the show will still be free and available to those who want to see it with just a little bit of a time delay. But if you love us, you love the work that we've been doing. We're now in the middle of our fourth season and we are the only show that consistently gets all of the major athletes after they win big tournaments. Uh, I'd love it if uh, you would just go to the link below down here and subscribe to be one of the first people to find out how you can subscribe to our upcoming uh, new thing that we're going to be doing. I'm very excited about it, and uh, I've talked with a few of our friends, many of whom have given wonderful feedback. So I always said, before we charge you a cent... For any of the content that we create here on this show, we will make sure to give you the best quality and maybe add a little bit of something new. So to find out what that is, just go to the link below. And uh, once you get there, just give us your email and we'll let you know in a very short amount of time. In any event, we have an incredible interview with J-Rod. Don't go anywhere because that interview is happening right now. What is up, grappling fans? It is your friendly neighborhood BJJ podcast, Rafa Sparza, coming to you on a wonderful day. Listen, we just saw an epic tournament. I don't know if you guys were watching, but my eyes were glued to the action that was taking place at ADCC Trials over in beautiful Las Vegas. There were a few surprises. There was a lot of people that we knew would do well. Some of our friends will be interviewing them later. That's perfectly fine. But there was definitely somebody... Even if you thought he'd do well, the way in which he dominated this trials run was impressive. Sure, you could say that he's been training for a year and a half, but you'd actually be lying because it's 17 months. I know because I actually I did the pre-interview with him and there was a very heated discussion between 17 months and a year and a half. I want to make sure we're billing him properly here, but this young man... He's done some incredible things already, and there's a lot of potential into what we will see him do in this sport. We've already seen him do well in wrestling, and he's been able to take a lot of that energy into the world of jiu-jitsu. And I'm excited to tell you that, yes, he will be at this year's ADCC. He qualified this weekend in the negative 88 kg category. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome for the very first time to the show, one, Jacob J-Rod Rodriguez. Jacob, how are you doing, sir? I'm good. How are you? Very well. Thank you so much for doing the show. Quick question. Do you refer to yourself as J-Rod or is it Jacob? Is it just J? I don't understand how these nicknames work. Um, I don't understand how they work either. Uh, everyone just calls me J-Rod or like J, J for sure. Sure. Okay. So when you introduce yourself, do you say, hello, my name is Jacob or do you do what I do, which is, hey, listen, my full name is Rafael. Good luck saying it like that. So just call me Raf. Do you just already go to them and be like, just call me J-Rod, man. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I just say, uh, hey, I'm Jay, because it's just short, sweet, whatever. But uh, yeah, it works. And, it, you know, it's fitting because it is pretty cool to see 
something already established within your family. Your brother has done an incredible job in his short journey here. And I remember years ago referring to him as a knockoff version, a Walmart version of The Rock. And lo and behold, here he is. Now you prove that there is a lot of strength in the family name because that would be two family members that have qualified for ADCC through the trials process. How did that feel like? And were you inspired by that performance when your brother was doing it to say like, yeah, I think I can do this. Yeah, absolutely. He's a, uh, he's the reason why I got into jujitsu. I was, um, I was in high school at the time when he was like uh, gaining momentum uh, and like starting jujitsu and stuff. And, uh, I thought I could do it, so I started. <laughs> <laughs> so at this time, though, you were doing uh, more wrestling, though, right? Yeah, so in high school, um, I would say probably junior year is when Nick like started doing jiu-jitsu. And um, at the time, I was only doing wrestling. I would wrestle uh, high school, and then in the summertime, I would uh, wrestle as well at like a, a club, a local club. And yeah, I, w- I would wrestle from PE around basically. What made you want to come play with us? Because you have a very fascinating and exciting sport and sometimes jujitsu be like, yeah, yeah. So, so I saw, like I said, I was in high school at the time and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with like the rest of my life. I, everyone says like, go to school cause I'm doing good in wrestling. So like, Oh, go D2, D3, D1, whatever. But, um, I saw Nick was doing very well and he started making money and stuff. And I was like, this looks awesome. I love competing. What, why can't I do this? So I, I started right after I uh, graduated what was the integration process like? Because I do tell this to some of the students that I have, which is if you wrestled before you speak part of the language, the translation might take a little bit, but you'll be ahead of those people who maybe have done other sports and maybe try to do jujitsu or come in just cold slate. Yeah. So transitioning into jujitsu i'm still doing it like it's still very hard and frustrating at times um the main thing for me uh was dealing with like leg entanglements and getting comfortable being on my back and stuff which i'm still dealing with now but um i was immediately forced to like fight off of my back and um be in these leg entanglements with the the people I was training with uh, from day one. When you say leg entanglements and stuff like that, usually that's stuff that we reserve for, mm, I don't know, man, sometimes people in their second or third month of jujitsu. In your particular case, with the guys that you're training with, um, I'm pretty sure they didn't wait too long to start attacking your legs because they figured they had to even out some part of the playing field if you were wrestling really well then as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there was like, I, I was at a different school at the time. So uh, the people I, I, were, I was training with were still very good, like very talented, um, not as well known, but good in their own right, you know? So there are the people that like, like drag me into like all the things I didn't want to do. You know, I didn't want to be on my back. I didn't want to be in these, you know, straight ankle locks, these heel hooks and stuff. So it's, you know, they, they played a big part in, in me getting so good in these areas. So let's talk a little bit about the tournament itself. Um, you obviously started competing a little bit, in the grand scheme of things, because you've only been training for so long, what tournament number for jiu-jitsu is this for you? Tournament number? Uh, let's see. I've done, like, one or two local, like, Nagas or Grappling Industries. Um, and then I did I did an IBJJF recently, uh, Worlds, I think. And... Uh, 
Oh, I did uh, Emerald City Invitational, which is uh, have I lost to uh, Taza in in uh, that, and then I had uh, uh, trials. So maybe about five or six is what we're looking yeah. at here. Okay, yeah. uh, you can understand this because you've seen a sense happen very quickly, especially close to you. Um, this is a rare case and I don't know if this makes sense to you. And I know that they always say that the competition experience that you have in wrestling is also very helpful because you have so many meets and so many different, uh, matches and and things that you do to help you prep for that. However, to come in on maybe your seventh tournament and win ADCC is rare. So to me, I know that it is difficult when you see people put up rankings and say like, oh, this guy's the favorite, this guy's the favorite. Some people may not have had you on that list just because they think, has he peaked yet? Has he even really gotten to the place where he's going to get? And this weekend, I think you quelled a lot of those answers because you made people look very, very elementary for what they do. And a lot of them are very good competitors. So what is the mentality like that helps you cross that bridge when you're competing at such a high level so quickly? Um, So there's, there's a few things like with, with wrestling, I've, I've been competing pretty much all my life. So uh, I never really get nervous per se. Like there's no, like all those crazy lights and it's all like dark and the spotlights on you. I'm kind of just comfortable in that area. I've, I've been there before. So I'm thankful for that. Um, and mentality wise, um, I always have, especially in jujitsu, I've been doing this for a, a year and a half, whatever. So I have like an underdog mentality. I have, when I go out there, I have nothing to lose. You know, if I was in the, like the black belt's position, I'm a black belt. I've been training for however many years and it's like, Oh my God, if I lose this blue belt, my world's fucking over, (laughs) but I'm a blue belt. I have nothing to worry about. You know what I mean? I I've not really beaten crazy names or anything. So it's not like have any pressure on me. And that's, that's how I compete Uh, pressure, like carefree. And it's just always worked like that. Well, good for you. That is, that is a very difficult thing to do. Like that mentality does not come easy And I know that there are people who, when they are learning this sport or any kind of sport, mentality plays such a key role in fast track development. And I know having resources like your brother, like your team, who have a plethora of matches and experiences that they can loan you, I think those are things that definitely speak in your favor. But I think this week you definitely not only came into your own, but you made a name for yourself. And that is hard to do when there are people who have come before you uh, to do that sort of a thing. Because when people saw you, they weren't saying like, nah, you know, he wrestles like his brother. Uh, You know, he wrestles or he he does this like Ethan or he does this like Nikki. They looked at you as your own being this weekend. So what I'm excited to do is we're going to do a little bit of match by match breakdown, but For me, before we even start talking about that, I think it is important to always give uh, due process and due credit to people who have made those things. So one of the things I get excited to interview people about when they have experiences like this is to say, like, here's the outside perspective. And maybe you don't see it. And if you do, it is sometimes nice to hear uh, somebody who's watching. And I don't know you. So when I, I see this and I know a lot of the guys, you know, I'm like, yeah, this kid's killing it and it is impressive. And you get a sense maybe on that first day, like he's going to be a problem tomorrow. I don't know what kind of problem exactly. Cause it's a huge tournament and statistically anybody can win, but like, God damn. So kudos to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start off. How many matches total did you end up having to do this weekend? Uh, I had seven matches total. So walk me through, before you even get to your first match, what is the travel, what is the week going into an ADCC trials look like for you? Um, So the week before, uh, we've obviously trained consistently, but uh, a training like heavily wise, we start to, like the upcoming weeks, we we push the intensity, and then the 
a few days before uh, the tournament, we start to come down and, you know, be sure no injuries happen and make sure your body's ready and not sore or anything for the upcoming tournament. Um, and then obviously we travel, uh, two or three days before, um, uh, train locally. And then, um, do you, you want me to tell you the, like the warm up as well and stuff like that? You know, that sounds like a lovely idea because yeah. I have an idea and you may not know this, but I'm just going to bet something here. I would almost guarantee you and I prep entirely different <laughs> between how we would compete. So yeah, I think that would be cool to hear if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah. 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 So, uh, when we get there, uh, I usually like to eat something light, like a fruit, uh, whatever. I just have like a little something in my stomach. So I'm not going all day long, uh, without eating, uh, obviously taking, uh, uh, you know, water in the proper amount and warm up wise, I say probably an, an hour before I get, get a light jog in, get my body moving. And then I like to, I like to sit down like a corner away from everyone, away from all noise and, um, uh, just close my eyes and envision, uh, what I plan on doing. Uh, not, not a specific game plan, but like what, what I, a vague outline of what I plan on doing. Um, I envision me winning. I envision me getting my hand raised and, uh, things like that. And then, uh, I start to stretch after that. And then I, have a hard, hard warm up where I'm trying to get dead tired. Like I want to blow my legs completely out. And then I relax, uh, 30, 20 minutes before the fight. And then probably 10, five minutes before the fight, I'm, uh, moving around, you know, just getting my body moving. So I'm not going in onto the mat cold. And then we walk out and compete. That's pretty cool. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for that insight. Now that we kind of have that as a marker of what you're doing as you're going into the actual tournament setting, uh, I do want to ask this. Day of, you get there. Now you're starting to actually get in the zone. So you start a run that is pretty impressive. And correct me if I'm wrong here. Did you sub your way through the entire tournament? Yes. Okay. Yes, so that, again, is another statistical anomaly. So that's a pretty impressive uh, feat to have. Um, the only other person that I saw who was close, uh, right about there, I thought in my head, was maybe William Tackett, who was also submitting his way throughout the entire tournament. And I yeah. remembered specifically looking at the two of you being like, man, both of these kids have really subbed their way to the finals. Good on them. That's a hard thing to do. So obviously we know things go well. What does this day start off like with you in that first match? Uh, first match was easy. I think I was, I was seated like 13th or something like that. So first match was uh, pretty easy. I think I subbed the guy in like a minute or two. Uh, just resting on the feet, and then I think I I might sn oh I go for a shot. He he backs away, and then he starts coming in. I go in for a double. I buy like pass his guard, take his back, and uh, strangle him. Dope, dope. So when you go through all of that mental process to get ready, and you get a pretty good result that quickly, you know what do you feel like after that? Because it's easy to become complacent, but you do want to sort of acknowledge like, okay, things are going, I visualized it, I made it work, now on to the next. So what do you do immediately after that match is done? Uh, so immediately after, I make sure I have a uh, cool down. I don't, like a, similar to the first jog of the day, just have a, a cool down where I'm light jog, maybe stretching out what, whatever I was like squeezing ex extensively, um, getting, just getting that body part moving and have a, a, a slow, uh, like decrease in heart rate and stuff like that. Just so my body is a crazy tight for my next, uh, match. Word. Okay, let's go to your second match. So what happens in your second match? And is it more of the same? 
or is it something a little bit different that happens in terms of that prep? Um, so prep is exactly the same for every single match throughout the tournament. Um, I don't know why, but whenever I have like my first match, I do good. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to have the exact same warm up every single time. And if I do it wrong, I'm going to lose in my head. So I have to do the warm up exactly the same. I don't know why, but, <laughs> uh, the match went, uh, different. Uh, the guy was pretty strong. He's like, he was not really like. He's hand fighting, but he's not like uh, like technically like getting me moving or anything. He's just like slapping the back of my head, I'm like okay, this guy's being kind of a douche. So uh, he keeps slapping or whatever, and I'm just like waiting for my moment. I end up taking an outside single later in the match, like like three or four minute minutes in. <clears throat> um, I go for the single. He sprawls. Uh, I start standing up. He goes for a guillotine. I defend the guillotine. We walk back into the center of the mat, and then I go for a double before he starts hand fighting again. And I believe he goes for another guillotine, but then he pulls, right? Like, he goes for a guillotine and tries to sit with it. So I defend the guillotine, escape, and then immediately uh, take his back, put one hook in, he starts rolling, and then I put the other hook in, and I finish with, like, a few seconds left, I think. Yeah, I noticed. I was, uh, of all kind of this weekend, that was the one that was like almost a, a buzzer beater, if you would, because it was it was close to the end, and obviously you were ahead on points by that point. So I was like, all right, well, he's going to advance. But it is pretty cool when you think it's almost done to see a submission happen with just a few seconds left on the clock. I don't know about you, but I, I know that I am the type that if that were to happen, there would be a little jolt of adrenaline that would come as a result of that. Is that something that happened with you? Because now you're starting to get that momentum swing. And again, it's always a balance of, nah, nah, nah job's not done. But you do probably feel a little good getting that out. Yeah, so I normally don't have any reaction to any of my matches. Like, I usually land, get a sub. No matter what I do, I usually just like, I'm like, okay, cool, I won. I walk off the mat. I, I'm usually just chill all the time. But this weekend was different. I don't know what was going on. <laughs> but I was, like, so pumped after that. And every single match after that, I was, like, every sub, I, w I was, like, screaming. I, would, I had no clue what was going on. That is not like me. So I get the sense you're a very nice kid. I've heard great things about you. You're the type that, wait, makes Keith Kikorian breakfast in the mornings just randomly. <laughs> like... Listen, you, you, you have a very good reputation about you, but uh, similarly, one of my friends, he recently fought and uh, he won his fight and at the end of it, he jumps on the top of the cage and afterwards I go talk to him. I'm like, Hey man, how'd it go? How are you feeling? He's like, I jumped on top of the cage and I was like, yeah, you did bud. And he goes, um, I don't know, man. I don't know that I should have done that. I was like, well, you did it. There's no taking it back. It's just what happened. And he goes, yeah. And he goes, well, what do you think? I go, I'd like to say I wouldn't. But sometimes in the moment, things happen. People yeah. have human reactions. And, yeah. you know, sometimes as much as I want to make fun of it, I also go, there is a part of you that says you earned it. So as I'm watching you, I know that you're feeling it, but... It's also, I think, in some ways wrong to tell you, like, no, nope, no, nope, don't feel good. It's like, dude, this is a run. If you don't experience that good elation right there, maybe you don't ever experience it like that again. You know, that that's Absolutely. a moment that you've, you've built and you captured. So you should feel no shame in any part of this or no, like, man, that felt weird. It didn't feel weird. It was right in the yeah. moment. So uh, when I saw you doing that, I actually, I was just laughing. I was like... Hey, good for him, man. That's pretty dope. Yeah. Because again, I'll tell you this much, and maybe you don't know this, but I have eight screens going as this tournament's happening. And mm -hmm. it's like being in a control booth in production because I'm looking over and I go, Jesus, okay, did he sub him here? Do I, oh shit, did he go now? Shit. And then some of your friends, they get eliminated. You go, oh, on camera two, not good. Oh, that's not great. But yeah. you pulled my sight when I saw you uh, after I think your second, because I saw you getting excited. I was like, Oh, 
Hey, they, he won. Good for the kid. All right. Awesome. So yeah. maybe if you hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have seen that submission because I thought it was going to points. Yeah. So yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's a good thing. Hey man, listen, I'm not going to tell you how to feel what you feel. Just when you do yeah. it, just try to be present. And I think people yeah. have different uh, philosophies on it. I, I think there's nothing wrong with it. But like one of my deepest memories is uh, of our mutual friend, Big J. After your brother won trials, Jay is about as beloved a person in our community can be. But I remember him screaming, yes, like right after your brother won. And I was like, that's a memory I'm always going to have of him because you yeah. don't you don't fake that. That's a real emotion. And uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I definitely have things like that that stick out. And I would tell you, Jay's not like that on a regular basis. You don't just <laughs> see him being like, ah! like you just normally yeah. see him like, hey, good job, guy. Yeah, I've, I've coached a yeah. lot of really good people. Everybody's okay. Uh, let's talk about your third match. So your third match happens on that Saturday. So is this the final match of that day? I think... Was no, it three no, and then four? I, or was I, it four and three? It was. I had two matches my first day because I had a bye. Right, right. And then, and then Sunday was was the third match. Okay. Um. So, this match was against. I think it was against a Deja Fresh guy. Um. He had a really tough close guard. He's like. I think he was going for like leg entanglements, whatever. But his close guard was like his strongest thing for sure. Um, I get in it. I try battle like passing. It wasn't really working too well. So I stand up. I retry. Stand up. Retry. And um, one of the times I stand up, this is probably like ha ha more than halfway through the, the fight. Um, I stand up and I'm like, okay, time's getting short. This isn't looking the best for me. So before we even like scoot back into the center, I like jump over the guy, like kind of cartwheel pass right to his back. I get one hook in. Um, he starts rolling. I try to get the other hook, but it was it was really shallow. And then I was still able to finish off to the side. And yeah, that's it. That's dope and impressive. I have to ask this because it does come up in a few minutes, but this need to buggy choke people. Mm -hmm. Listen, I'm old. When you're old and you see the new generation, you see the Rotolos hitting people with this thing that proves maybe side control isn't as safe as we thought it was. Um, you think to yourself, this is some bullshit. I don't need this in my life. <laughs> Then I see you do it and I go, oh, that would be problematic. Okay. And then not only do I see you do that, but then I see you tell someone as good as Craig Jones that he's not safe because you will buggy choke him. And are you saying now that you're going to buggy choke him at ADCC? Is that the plan uh, now? I mean, if it's there, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we buggy choke each other all the time in training. Um there's like, he, him and I are always doing like I get all the stupid bullshit moves from him. <laughs> like every everything that like shouldn't work that does work is is inspired by him. So when did you develop a buggy choke? Like when did you guys uh, start using that as part of your repertoire? Because the team's pretty versatile already. I didn't know that they necessarily needed that, but now yeah. it's something else to be concerned about. Yeah. So before a. F a few months before I moved to Texas to train with them, I was like watching YouTube videos of the Rotola brothers, like hitting it and stuff. And I'm like, this is awesome. I have to learn this. So I started playing around with it here and there. And I started getting more flexible because of it. Like I'm kind of forced to be more flexible. Mm -hmm. And, um, I moved to Texas and Craig and I start rolling and stuff. Everyone really like there's a few guys that hit it pretty often in, in the gym as well. Um, and it's just kind of a thing now. Like uh, I'll, I'll hit it on Craig and then he'll like go to his back and buggy choke me and he'll finish me. Like there's always, I haven't finished Craig with it yet, 
but it's coming for sure. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> I wasn't sure if you led us to believe when you said, oh, yeah, we kind of go back and forth, buggy choke each other all the time. What I think you were yeah, meaning oh, no, to no, say no. was, no, he buggy chokes me and I hate <laughs> him, but it's coming yeah. for him. Yes, yes, okay. it is definitely coming for him. Okay. It hasn't happened yet, but... I, listen, I, I know I wouldn't say this for a lot of 17 month into their journey people. I wouldn't necessarily tell them I believe in your talent to pull this off because that's a pretty high high risk, high reward sort of move. Yeah. I, I kind of believe in you. I think it could work yeah. for you. <laughs> I think the, the nice thing that I see with Craig is, uh, I don't know, the kids, they love the Moon Knight right now, but there's a Moon Knight meme where it just is him going, random bullshit, go! And I feel like that's what Craig Jones's offensive arsenal is, because anytime yes. I see the highlight or the security cam footage, I think to myself, why would you train with this man? Like, I used to before, when he would come to LA, be like, hey man, you want to link up? Uh, I'll find a place, whatever. Now that I look at him, I'm like, you know what, dude? I think we're good. I yeah. think we're good. I can, you know, be a Muppet on the sidelines making fun of everybody with you, but <laughs> I, I don't know that this is a smart idea for me. Yeah. There's everyone. There's a reason why everyone says fuck Greg Jones. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's very frustrating to roll with, but at the same time, it's, it's entertaining. It's fun. Well, it's clearly helping very you. Informative. It, yeah. it is very much, uh, when you say informative, it's also informing a great deal of your offensive and your defensive maneuvers, because yeah. I think you can't overstate how much that room has made you acclimated to the jiu-jitsu side of high impact training so that it makes when you do go out there, not necessarily a surprise. It's just maybe a surprise to everybody else who hasn't seen some of those rounds. So yeah. I think that's the interesting thing. Talk me through your next match because you went from uh, doing that. Uh, I think you went next against the guy from autos. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So this is, yeah. Autos. So, uh, he, he pulled guard. Um, he pulls guard. I'm like working high step passing and it's working a little bit, but I'm still like working on the move. So it's not perfect. And I keep, he keeps ending up in like trying to force like leg entanglements and stuff. So, uh, I, he wasn't very good with the leg entanglements. I think I took his back pretty early in the match, but I wasn't able to finish. He escapes. Uh, we do the same thing for a few minutes. And then uh, overtime comes. Uh, we're wrestling. I go to take him down. And I think he, we end up in a front head situation where he has... I don't think he has a Dars. He has like the lock on the outside. Um, and I, I was able to just kind of like... I, I was able to endure. And then he lets go and tries taking my back. I stick my arm out so I can come up to his leg. And that stops him. I come up to a body lock. And then uh, he goes quad pod. And I put the far hook in. And then he stands up when I put the far hook in. So I get both hooks in. I lock up the body triangle. And then I finish standing rear naked choke. That's pretty dope. And... Again, momentum's going well. Are you getting any good advice in between rounds? Um, because there's something that I think is building on your team. And it, it comes to a fruition, and I'll ask about that later. But are you getting any good advice or notes from people on the sidelines, either in between matches or during matches? Yeah, so basically most of my matches, all I hear is everyone screaming and stuff. Except for Nikki Ryan. Nikki Ryan is like whispering <laughs> into my ear like an angel. He's helping me out with like every little thing. Like every time I get to a uh, position, I can hear him like telling me exactly what to do. And yeah, he helped me out like the entire tournament. I my finals match, I was I told Nick like before we walked out, I said I I need Nikki Ryan in my my corner. Damn, that's pretty cool to hear. And I think this weekend maybe holds the record for the most emotion we've ever seen out of Nikki Ryan because, you know, normally the kid's pretty reserved and he's pretty to himself. 
And I don't know, know him personally. I've interviewed him a, a couple times, but I definitely saw Craig Jones putting up those photos of him. And I go, well, I've never seen that. That face yeah. <laughs> is like a child getting into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. <laughs> like that's a kid who had delight in his eyes. So I could yeah. tell he was hyped for his team. Yeah, it's, it's good. We, we have a healthy relationship at a uh, B team. Well, that, that's good to hear. And obviously, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have questions as to other things. I'm not really interested in that because I think that's pretty dumb. I'm more interested yeah. in the process of what you guys have built because that's the impressive thing is that it seems like it's a collective of people who have these individual talents and they realize they could pull their talents together. And I think that's been a lot of the story. So when you see Craig saying that there's going to be five members from B team that are going to be competing at ADCC, it's pretty good. That's pretty good for anybody, most schools. Yeah. But for one school, let alone a new school, it is pretty cool to watch. So uh, as, a, as a fan and a spectator on the side, there was a lot that I witnessed that I was uh, very pleased about for you guys in particular. So now we move again. We move closer. Now we're getting even closer to our end goal. Tell me about that next match. Um, so I think this match was against... Uh, this one's Bradley. Adam Bradley. Yep. Yes. All right. So he was very, very tough. Um, it was hard to get him tired. I don't really remember too much of what happened early on. All I really remember is we're hand fighting. I think this this one went to overtime. Um, we're hand fighting. Uh, I'm like trying to. Uh, get in on a single, get in on like outside single specifically because he was coming in like in and out. So it was hard to do the double. Um, so eventually I take a shot. I'm on like one knee and one knee's up. I'm like ready to go in for another single. He starts walking towards me. I get to one leg um, and he goes for uh, a trip. I forget what it's called, but he goes for a trip and then I, I have one, like, I'm grabbing uh, his far hip. I try reaching for his other leg, and he's not moving. So I come up really quick, and I trip, like, inside trip him. And then I get, he goes uh, turtle. I go for a uh, far hook. And then he goes rolling to his back. I get the other hook in, and then I was able to finish again on the back. Yeah, that was... Uh... That was pretty impressive because uh, Bradley is a, a friend of the show. So um, there comes a point, and I think some people who do these kind of podcasts and shows, um, where you kind of go, all right, friends of the show are now going against each other. Like, <laughs> not necessarily somebody I know, but we know enough of the same people that I'm obviously seeing you do well. That I go, no, he's he's probably going to be in that consideration. And then I start thinking, like, who the hell am I going to interview? Because at this point, I don't even know. I just look over and I go, well, shit, uh, it's on you guys at this point. So when I saw that, um, obviously it was a good match. But I thought one thing that made me laugh was I saw you repost Bradley uh, saying he was getting some shit from his blue belts. Do you <laughs> mind to tell us what that was about, if you could? Um, so I think Gordon was posting him, like me subbing him and like talking shit and like all of like Gordon's like, uh, like fans, I guess were like talking shit on him. And then, uh, like yesterday he posted on a story saying how I like ruined his life. <laughs> Obviously joking, joking, joking. Saying yes. how, yeah. Saying how I ruined his life and how blue belts now think he could, they can beat him. And uh, how no one like shows up to his class or buys his DVDs anymore is fucking hilarious. Yeah, I I know Adam is having a, a pretty decent sense of humor with us. So when yeah. I saw that, I go, you know, that's probably about the healthiest kind of competition set of jokes you can see. Is that, <laughs> uh, you know, obviously it's a good self-deprecation joke, but it's one that is true. I mean, you're you're a blue belt, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I I got my purple belt in the finals after the finals. Correct. But at that point, you were a blue belt in yeah. that moment. So yeah, sure. Maybe it might make it sting a little bit less that now you're a 
purple belt. Um, yeah. But, you know, none of those things matter at ADCC. At that point, it's just like, it's not like somebody goes, oh, you can't sub him. He's a he's a brown belt. You can't. Yeah. You know, it's just all things are, are equal. Once you get out there, it's all a matter of skill and what you do. So, yeah, I thought that was particularly funny. And I, again, much love to him. I think he's a very solid competitor. Um, always absolutely. been absolutely very nice to us. So uh, when I saw that, again, it's one of those things where you go, Okay, now we're to that final part of the dance. Talk to me about semifinals, sir. Uh, semifinals, they set the mats all cool, all the lights, <laughs> camera action. Um, this guy, Crisp, Crisp, I think his name is, he was the like hardest, like physically, like, I, like you touch him and like your finger doesn't sink in, like this guy's made of steel. Um, he's like coming in really hard, very, uh, not dirty, but like aggressive, like really aggressive wrestler on the feet. Uh, he's coming in like really hard. He comes in for a collar tie. Um, I grab his elbow and he's controlling my other hand and I go for the duck under right to his back, get two hooks in and finish him on his back. All right. Now that that happens, you know that you're about to go into the finals. What is it like going to that final for you, sir? Um, so I didn't watch him compete, and I I didn't know who, who he was before. I, I think I saw him on who's number or who's next. Or no, who's number one against uh, Hillbilly. But aside from that, I haven't seen him compete or anything. And when he was competing, I was like in the back room, like cooling down, whatever, just getting away from all the crowd before I get like nervous or anything. Um so, you, what did you ask? Sorry. Oh, I was just asking, what was that prep like? Because are you the type that watches him or your other opponents? Because it could not be him. It could be somebody else. It could have been, I think it was Garmo and him. Um, so, yeah, I mean, are you watching that match that's happening between the two of them? No, no, I'd, I'd rather not know who I'm going against and not, like, not know what they do or anything. Word. Okay. So now let's talk about this final because, again, this is where that myth of that buggy choke comes back into fruition because Hunter's not an easy match. And in fact, I was actually really stoked when it was the two of you because I know what he brings. Um, again, friend of the show. And I know what you bring. So I'm a big proponent of Styles Make Matches. He's very aggressive. You obviously can handle that, but you proved that you could be crafty with the way that you set up that. So tell us a little bit about that execution, because I think you also were, uh, there was a video of you explaining the adjustments that you were making in order to make this happen. So I kind of wanted to go over that as well. So do you mind walking us through uh, that match yeah. and that finish? Yeah. So, uh, he was really tough. He was, uh, like constantly going for trying to enter legs and uh, stuff like that. And I was kind of just kind of trying to like in, endure, like float around and stuff. And then he ends up on top and then I go for like a few buggy choke attempts. And then the one that I lock up is uh, pretty tight. I was able to adjust it. So it was, it was tight, but um, he was safe because it, the buggy choke was like, pretty high like it wasn't like smothering him he was safe um so instead of keeping the buggy choke locked with my hands i took my other hand and grabbed my far shin and i took my other hand and i hand fought i tried to dig his hand away because he was like in there pushing away by uh at my hip and stuff like that so i dig his hand out and i take my knuckles and I, like, put it in his neck, and that's what was, like, that was what helped me finish. Um, and that's, like, another thing. I've never, like, done that before, but this is something that I get from Craig. Like, Craig and I do stupid shit like this all the time to each other. And it's usually just me getting fucked up, but I still learn something from it. <laughs> so, in the end... It's there's a positive. Yeah, I think there's always a positive. I, I I'm a huge um, 
a lot of my game is is uh, defensive. So a lot of what I do when I first roll with somebody, aside from being a smart ass uh, who makes a lot of jokes at people's expense, is that I know they're probably coming to murder me. But I usually tend to download their game. So I, in my first yeah. roll with somebody, I just kind of go like, hey, listen, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm just trying to make sure I'm safe. You're safe. And then there are small adjustments that I make based off of what they're doing. So there's always something to be said about sometimes just feeling it out. And, and for Craig's particular skill level, like, yeah, he's, he's throwing random shit at you, but that's because I think sometimes he's just bored. I think sometimes when yeah. you're that good, you know, you can get bored. So you want to innovate and do new things so that you can keep yourself interested for your particular case though. You know, you mentioned about doing this random thing, but it's not that different from, say, if you have a no arm triangle and you're trying to finish it and sometimes you don't have the neck. So then you start yeah. to bring in maybe a fist into there. Like I've seen people make those kind of small adjustments that still get the tap. And that's the most important thing to get. So yeah. if anything, it's just showing the smart aptitude because I wasn't 100 percent sure that was in there, I knew it was problematic. And the, I think the real art of the buggy choke is, is you might be able to get out of it if you have time. In this particular case, there was time on the clock, but maybe not time in that choke or that bad of a predicament. So I think that's why, uh, even though it looked like, man, I don't know, it's close, you making those adjustments or what made it actually a tap. So yes. uh, congratulations yeah. to you on that. There's a moment Thank that you. I was alluding to earlier because we talk about what your team has been building, but can you describe that moment that has been photographed and it's all of you guys over on the map? Can you describe what was going through your head? Because that photo is so great and I think tells a great, not only story about your team, but about your accomplishment, there's also, you know, your brother's in it, super proud of you. Like there's a lot that's in that photo, but there's a photo of all of you guys celebrating after you win. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's not like it's me and my brother and we're like, we're the closest and like everyone else is like kind of close. We're like, we're a team, you know, we're, we're teammates and we're all very close to each other. We, you know, a lot of us stood in the same house uh, when we were in Vegas. Uh, every day, we're obviously we're training together. We're like, we're joking around and like just like bonding. It's it's not a uh, like I said earlier. It's it's a healthy relationship we all have at B Team, you know. Um, and I'm very thankful for it. I, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did last weekend if it wasn't for them. Yeah, you. You guys, I just thought that was such a special moment uh, to witness because it's really one of those moments that you all got to celebrate together and you could see how close your team was and is. So uh, there was a, a very nice feeling to to get it. And even though they were celebrating you, I think they were also celebrating what the team has accomplished. So it felt like a, absolutely a good moment for all of you to share in. So and and again, as somebody who's interviewed, I think all of them, I think everybody. Yeah, everybody um, like I, I know them. I know they're a little more reserved uh, at a lot of different functions. Some of them get bored sometimes in their brains of how they look yeah. when they win, just cause it's like, you know, don't show too much, but that was really cool to see. So, um, I was very impressed with that. I would like to ask this, what does the celebration look like for you? Because something cool happens. Do you get any good notes from people calls? Do you have anything that's memorable that happens after let's say, you end up getting the win. Uh, so right after I got the win, obviously I hug all my teammates, whatever I run off the mat. And then, and then I got interviewed like two or three times and there's nothing really like, there's no like crazy celebration. Like that was the celebration, you know, hugging all my teammates in, in that moment. But, uh, you know, we, we get the medal, we go home, and they're like, oh, let's go out, let's go out. I'm like, I just want a steak, and I want to go to sleep. <laughs> I've been trying to kill people all weekend. I'm tired. 
And, uh, yeah, that, that was really it. We had some of the guys come over and, and, you know, talk and stuff and eat. But uh, that was about it. That's awesome. And, obviously, you can tell the Rodriguez boys the celebration of choice is to get meat quickly, preferably steak. Yes. <laughs> I'm fairly certain it will be medium, uh, if not more rare than anything. Um, but yeah. That is, that is pretty cool to see. I would also like to know this because I would love to know what kind of advice that you have. You have a very cool insight in that you haven't been with us in the jiu-jitsu community for a very long time, but notable still. What advice do you have for those people that might help them should they be trying to replicate an ADCC run such as yours? Uh, yeah, so there's, with a short amount of time, there's a lot of things, techniques and stuff that you're going to need to learn. Um, the main thing is persevering through the stuff that you're learning and just accept that you're going to get the shit beat out of you. You know, honestly, like it sucks. It, it's really terrible, but you start to get better and better at these techniques and you don't have to have like a crazy amount of stuff that, you know, the stuff that you do know, make sure that they are perfect. Make sure that you know the ins and outs of like everything that these that these moves that you're doing, you know. And once you perfect these these few moves, uh, you're going to be very successful. Very cool. Very good to hear. I just want to tell you this, man. I, I'm so happy for your journey and your story because it is so easy to um, become uh, somebody who's trying to just emerge and, and, you know, make themselves their own story, you know, especially when you have a, a notable brother. But I think this was you coming out, making a name for yourself, doing it with your team, with him as well, obviously. But this was a cool moment where I just said, like, this is so great when you see like the little brother come out of uh, their own shell and they're being like, Hey, listen, obviously I love my brother. I train with him. I live here. It's great. But you stood on your own ground. You made a name for yourself this weekend. And that is something that you should be very proud of in your own accomplishments and what you did. And obviously it's going to be cool to see. It looks like now you're going to be taking this on the road. I see that you got some seminars uh, coming up uh, with oh, Big yeah. J on over on the East Coast. Is that something you're looking to extend? And if so, where are you looking to go? Um, well, I'll be in training training in uh, Texas, but I, I planned on a few weeks ago, I planned on coming back to Jersey just to uh, visit family and stuff uh, for like a week or two. So after winning, Jay was like, I had asked him um, where, uh, where should I train? And he used, he gave me a location and was like, Oh, do you also want to do some like locations and stuff? Or uh, do you also want to do some seminars and stuff? And I was like, I mean, I'm down. Sure. <laughs> and after this weekend, it's like, crazy to see like people like people want to learn from me people want to do privates and stuff it's uh it's great to see like i can finally make like kind of a living out of this i'm not making crazy money but it's a start for sure well you're around good people who know how to maximize what it is that they do so that always does help but you know, the nice part is now you have a nice moniker to the name that allows people to know like, hey man, you're always going to be an ADCC finals or a trials winner. You're always going to be that guy who was on that show. And coming up, you'll be an ADCC participant, which if you think about it, is our Olympics. So no matter what happens, they'll never take that away from you. I think what people are also understanding is you could also do very, very well at this tournament. So if that's the case, yeah, they kind of want to learn from you. I think um, one of the things I've learned in my time is, is that I've always been open to those people who compete and have a high degree of success and learning from them. Even if they're not the best of teachers, I do like seeing their process. And I think that is always fascinating to see. So obviously this is the verbal process, but 
sometimes there are people who just compete and they may not have the greatest articulation, but they might be like, hey, listen, this is how I did this. And there is a very cool and great insight. The thing that benefits you is you're around multiple great teachers. So that means that you yourself have a high likelihood of also being a good teacher. And if you add in the wrestling, you know, there's a lot of stuff that guys don't know about wrestling and jiu-jitsu. We, let's be real. Most of us are kind of like, uh, yeah. stand up, but nah, that's not <laughs> It's lame. Uh, so anyway, there's there's a lot of great stuff in there. As we start to wrap this up, I'm going to start asking people this very soon for all of our trials winners. But I'd love to know. We're going to put the camera on you, and I just want to ask you right now, talk directly to the camera, and tell us what we can expect to see from you at this year's ADCC, sir. Uh I mean, I really don't like to be cocky or anything, but uh, I'm just going to go out there and do what I do. You know, I'm going to try. I'm not going to fucking quit. I'm not going to stop. But uh, I don't know. It's going to be exciting no matter what. So, Hey, listen, there's always something to be said is don't ever uh, underestimate either a blue belt or the man who just goes, I don't know. I mean... I might murder somebody with a buggy truck. Who knows? I don't know, man. I'm just, yeah. I'm just trying to do my thing. I think it's cool for you to be uh, humble in your journey. I think that is always important. Um, but I think that this weekend also showed you know how to be a showman in front of a big crowd. And that's something that we kind of need. So it's great to see you doing it. And like I said, man, uh, all of your references checked out in terms of the people that we know in a similar Venn diagram. They've always said great things about you. I knew that this interview would probably come at some point, And I'm glad that we were able to mark the occasion because we do like to acknowledge the hard work of the, our athletes in our sport. So congratulations to you, sir. It is well-deserved. And uh, feel Feel free to shout out anybody who helped to get you to that stage, but the floor is all yours, sir. You can also shout out any sponsors who helped take care of you. All right. Thank you for that. Um, obviously, thank you for my teammates at B-Team. Um, they got me to where I am now. Uh, thank you to Jay, always being there. Uh, thank you, Level Black, for supporting me. You know, he, he even... Uh, Shipped me stuff to Vegas because he wanted me to wear like a specific stuff uh, for the trials. Um, who else? Uh, uh, obviously, my parents. You know, uh, I have. I, I'm fortunate to uh, not have like any pressure from them. Like a lot of kids do sports and stuff, and they have like pressure from their parents. Um, I never had that in my life, which is awesome. Like. I don't, I never had to wrestle. Like I never had someone telling me to do anything. I did it because I wanted to, and I do jujitsu because I love it. It's, I want to do it. So, uh, thank you, mom and dad. Hi mom. Um, that's about it. All right, man. Well, listen, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Um, can't wait to see what you're going to be doing over at ADCC. I hope that people take you up on seminars and for privates because already it looks like good shit. And, you know, it's already looking like a, a very promising future. So we're not just looking at ADCC. We're looking at that and beyond for you. So we're very glad to have had this first opportunity to interview you. And I know that's going to be the first of many, sir. So my thanks to you, my man. Thank you for that. No problem. All right, guys, don't go anywhere. We will be right back after this. Thank you so much for watching our interview with J-Rod himself. Uh, kid's super nice. I, I think the world of him, 17 months, goes to show you that's a lot, a lot of potential in this young man, and I cannot wait to see what they are able to get him do in just five to six months more for this year's ADCC. Uh, before we leave, we just wanted to do a quick little plug and reminder. Just to let you know, check us out on Grappling Hour on the Facebook. That's right, Facebook. The thing that sometimes your grandma gets misinformation from, but also a place where you can find some of the information about us here at the Grappling Hour. So go check that out. And don't forget, down below, click that link if you want more information, you like this interview, and you want to find out how you can subscribe to us in the future. That's going to do it for us here at the Grappling Hour. My name's Rafa Sparza. It's been a great day for grappling. We'll see you back on the mats.
Perfect. Perfect.